Good evening, brethren. Please take your Bibles and turn to Luke 24. Turn to Luke 24. And uh, we're going to be looking at verse number 44. Luke 24, verse 44. Uh, tonight's preaching is going to be more of a Bible study. Uh, we are. This is something that I've been wanting to preach for a long time, actually. I just needed the right time to do it. And I really... I really appreciate the book of Psalms. You know, I don't don't know if you're the same as me. I I look at the book of Psalms and I I think about how wonderful the songs are. I think about how wonderful the words are. Many times, you know, in in my life where I've struggled to pray, where I've had some concerns, some grief, I've turned to the book of Psalms and I've been able to just just meditate on those words and, and pray unto the Lord and sing unto the Lord. And many times just, just seeing the heart of, of you know, David, David, one of, one of the psalmists, and, and many of the other psalmists, just seeing their heart and seeing, hey, these are just normal men. These are men that have fears. These are men that have weaknesses. These are men that desire to know God. You know, these are men that desire to find comfort and, and shelter and, and strength in the Lord. And, you know, all of us can relate to that. All of us have gone through difficulties, have gone through fears, have gone through just all kinds of difficulties in life. And we can all look at the Psalms and say, Lord, you know, I need you. I need to to know more of you. And and so the Psalms is is wonderful in that sense. You know, it's even, you know, it's the songbook of the Bible. You know, I mean, there are other songs. Solomon is another songbook. But it is, of course, the the main songbook in the Bible. But look at Luke 24 and verse 44. Luke 24 and verse number 44. And of course, this is after Jesus Christ was uh, resurrected from the dead and he went to the disciples. And it says in verse number 44, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms, concerning me okay so the title for the sermon tonight is jesus in the psalms jesus in the psalms what does jesus say there once again he says that uh, these things were written in the law of moses and in the prophets and in the psalms concerning me concerning jesus look at verse number 45 then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures, that they might understand the scriptures. So my goal for this uh, uh, sermon tonight is that I would help open, uh, uh, help open your understanding of the scriptures, help open your understanding of the book of Psalms. So when next time you go reading through the book of Psalms, you can sort of pick out, you know, the places that you've seen Christ. And, and look, I'm not going to cover everything. You know, I'm going to cover the, the main portions of the Psalms that I know speak of Christ. But there will be other places in the book of Psalms as, as you do your reading, as the Holy Ghost works in you, you know, enlightens your understanding of the Bible, he'll be able to show you some great pictures of Christ in the book of Psalms. So now please do go to Psalms, Psalms uh, chapter 8, please. Go to Psalms chapter 8. And uh, we're going to see where it speaks of Christ. Okay, Psalms chapter 8. And, you know, you can turn to other passages if you want. I really just want you to stay in the book of Psalms. I mean, if you can stay there and you can turn fast enough to these other references, that would be great. Otherwise, just stay in the book of Psalms and you'll be able to get a lot of the message tonight. But Psalms chapter 8 and verse number 4 reads, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and has crowned him with glory and honor. So some great words there. And this speaks of the birth of Christ. This speaks of the incarnation. And in verse number four, it says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? You see, when Christ uh, was born in Bethlehem, when God sent his son to be born of, of the virgin, he did it because he had man in mind. He did it because he had you and I in his mind. And of course, he knows of our sinful state. And he knows about our need for a savior. And so he sent his son to come to the earth. And look at verse number five there. It says, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, that's speaking of man, and has crowned him with glory and honor. And this passage is found once again in the New Testament. And I'll just read the passage to you in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, 
or the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. So not only did Christ come, not only did he come to visit us, I mean, to think about the God of the universe visiting man. You know, we speak about visitors that come to our house, we like to be hospitable to our visitors. We'd often feed them. We'd communicate with them, enjoy their company. And yet Christ was coming not to be received, but actually he knew that he would be rejected. He knew that he would be rejected of man. And he was made a little lower than the angels that speak of mankind. But then it said in Hebrews 2.7, And did set him over the works of thy hands. So Jesus Christ came to work. Jesus Christ did not come to be served. He, he came to serve. He came to work. And of course, he came preaching the gospel. He came preaching great truths of the Bible. He came preaching how we ought to live our lives. And he came preaching the Great Commission. He came preaching about he being that sacrifice for our sins. And so, you know, in, in the Psalms, we see the purpose of Christ and the fact that he would come to be born, um, that, he, you know, he'd he'd go for that incarnation, that he would come in the flesh. And of course, if you can now, now go to Psalms 78, and I spoke about this a little, little bit, you know, he came doing the works that the Father had set him to do. But in Psalms 78 verse 1, we get an idea of the kind of teaching that Christ would teach. In Psalm 78 verse 1, the Bible reads, um, Give ear, O my people, to my law, Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Okay, so what does the Psalms speak of here? That when Christ comes teaching, he's going to come teaching in parables. What else is it? It says, I will utter dark sayings of old. Okay, so what Jesus Christ came teaching wasn't brand new things. He came teaching old things. He came teaching things that you'll find in the prophets, in the, in, in the book of Moses, the writings of the prophets, again, the writings of the Psalms, okay? But they were dark sayings, okay? So they were hidden to some. And of course, we, we get that teaching of, of Christ that he had opened up the ears of understanding of certain people that they may be able to understand the parables, understand the, the secret messages of the parables. And for others... Others that God did not want to convert, others that God did, wanted to hide certain truths from, he would speak in dark sayings, in parables, so they would not be able to understand. And this is then confirmed for us in the book of Matthew, Matthew 13, verse 34, which says, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. And so these dark sayings, they're of old, they go back to the foundation of the world. I mean, the things that Jesus Christ spoke of and taught of were things that were being taught, once again, throughout all the generations leading up to Christ. And he came here, he came clarifying those dark saints. He came clarifying those parables to those that would have ears, that would listen unto Christ. And, um, you know, I, I, love, I love the fact that, you know, the Bible is so exact. Not only that he would be born, but the way he would come teaching was teaching in, in parables. You know, this is why it's important that you know, you, you understand that parables are dark sayings. You understand that parables are, are, are taught in, in that way uh, for certain truths to be hid. And this is why you'll often find pastors, and even myself included, would say, don't build your doctrine from a parable. You know, make sure the parables uh, uh, assist with a doctrine. Make sure they help uh, illustrate a doctrine. But you don't build a doctrine from a parable on its own because the purpose behind that parable was for it to be dark, for it to be hidden to some hearers. And so you can fall into the trap of creating things that aren't actually true or things that Jesus Christ did not actually uh, specifically point to in that parable. Okay, so not only do we know that Jesus Christ came teaching in parables, but we know that toward the end of the ministry of Christ, 
that he would come into Jerusalem. Remember, he would be riding on that donkey uh, triumphantly into, into Jerusalem, and many would come laying palms before him on, the, on that uh, donkey. And if you can go to Psalm 118, go to Psalm 118, and it tells us what these people that were, uh, you know, the, these people of Jerusalem and from Galilee that would, that would come with Christ, what they would be saying on that very day that Christ would be coming into, into Jerusalem, Psalm 118 and verse 26. The Bible reads, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. I love that. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. I mean, this was being taught to us in the Psalms. Okay, And of course, when Christ would come on that donkey into Jerusalem, we read about this in, in Matthew 21 verse 8. It says, And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and straw them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Okay. So they're just there praising God, praising Christ as he comes into Jerusalem. But the Bible says that he's coming in the name of the Lord. Hey, when Christ came, he came in power, he came in authority, he came doing the will of God, he came doing the works of God. He came in the power of God, in the authority of God. And that's what people were doing when they were worshipping him. And you know, the saddest thing about not having church at this point in time with this lockdown is the fact that, you know, we can't be like these people at this point in time where we're gathered together, worshipping Christ, blessing God with our worship. You know, and that's what it is to bless God. You know, we are, we are called to bless God. Have you ever wondered, what can we do to bless God? We know that God can bless us, but what can we bring to the table? Well, it's our worship. It's our songs of praises. It's our voices lifting up God for who He is, lifting up Christ for the works that He did, for His sacrifice. Praising God is blessing God. You know, and I can't wait to be back in church. I can't wait to be back again with my, with my brethren, both here on the sunny coast and down in Sydney, where we can have church services and sing with glad, glad hearts, with joyful hearts, singing praises unto the Lord, singing Hosanna to the Son of David, worshipping Christ once again. And of course, as Christ would come into Jerusalem, he came teaching in the temple. You know, those that were believers, those, you know, many would flock to Christ. You know, some had obviously heard what John the Baptist taught. You know, how John the Baptist pointed to the Lamb of God, which take away the sins of the world. But then you had your religious leaders. You know, you had those um, of, of authority, and they would be rejectors of Christ. And if you can look at uh, Psalm, you're in Psalm 118, but look at verse number 22 now. Psalm 118, look at verse number 22. It says here, The stone which the builders refused is become the head stone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Okay, And of course, Jesus Christ would be that stone that the builders refused or the builders rejected, as it's said in the New Testament. And I'll just read that to you in Matthew 21, verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Okay, so when we read this in Psalm 118, verse number 22, it's saying that, that Christ is the stone which the builders refused. Christ became that stone or that the Messiah, of course, that would be rejected by, by the nation of Israel, that would be rejected by the authorities, by reje would be rejected by the religious leaders. And then Christ comes explaining that, well, this means that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. Okay, and be given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And of course, that is a holy nation. 
It's that spiritual nation. It's a nation that's made up of Jews and Gentiles that believe on Christ. The kingdom of God has been given to the spiritual nation of, of Israel, the Israel of God, not some physical carnal nation okay, of Christ rejectors. And Jesus Christ came teaching this in light of the stone that would be rejected. And again, it said this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. You know what's marvelous? The fact that Christ came to die for all nations. That Christ came offering the gospel to all peoples. That's what's marvelous. The fact that he would bring all into one fold, all into one spiritual nation. And again, you know, it, it, it's so frustrating to hear, you know, other preachers speak about how, how the Jews are their own special nation of God. You know, God has his own physical nation that he loves and cares about. That, you know, they're the apple of God's eye. No, what's marvelous is that God will take the believers of that nation and believers of all nations and make them one people. And that God will reject those that reject Christ. You see, you cannot have God without Christ. You cannot have the Father without the Son. You, if the only way you can have the Father is by having the Son. The only way to the Father is through the Son, is through Jesus Christ. And the Jews, you know, or sorry, I should say that many preachers say, well, the Jews, they worship the Father and we worship the Son. No, they don't worship the Father. They worship a false God. They do not know the God of the Bible because they don't know Jesus Christ. If they knew the God of the Bible, if they believed the writings of Moses, they would have believed on Christ as well. Okay, so the book of Psalms also speaks about the, reject, the rejection of Christ. How the nation of Israel, you know, many of them, the majority would reject Christ. But of course, there were those that would also believe on Christ. And thank God for those, okay, because they started the New Testament churches. They went out as the disciples of Christ, you know, you know uh, completing the Great Commission in their generation. So then the, the gospel message will be passed down unto us that we can believe and enter into that kingdom as well. All right, look at Psalm 41 for me now. Psalm 41 and verse number 9. Psalm 41 and verse number 9. Because after he went into Jerusalem and after he would be rejected by the nation, well, not only was he rejected by the nation, but he was rejected by one of his disciples, one of his very close apostles, of course, that is Judas Iscariot. And this is also spoken about in the book of Psalms. Psalms 41 and verse number 9 reads... Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat at my, of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Jesus Christ, there's a prophecy here of Christ that he would be rejected by a close friend. That this close friend would eat the same bread as Christ. And of course we know when it comes to the, uh, the Last Supper that Judas Iscariot was there participating on that Last Supper, eating of that bread, but that same one would be the one that would reject Christ, that would not just reject Christ, but betray Christ. And this is confirmed as, as a, a point to Christ in Matthew 26, verse 24, which reads, The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had never been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. Okay, Master, is it I? Said Judas Iscariot. Jesus said, Thou hast said. You are the betrayer. You are the one that should have never been. It would have been better if you just were never born. Why would, why would it be better that he'd never be born? It's because Judas not only betrayed Christ, he did not even believe on Christ. Okay, he became reprobate by rejecting Christ. And his end would be in hell, of course, after he committed suicide. So even the betrayal of Judas Iscariot is captured for us in the book of Psalms. Now, please go to Psalm 35. Psalm 35. And of course, once Christ would be betrayed by his close apostle, he'd be arrested. And the, you know, the, the religious leaders of that day, they wanted to kill Christ, but they couldn't find anything against him. So they had to try to make up false accusations, right? They tried to find people that would falsely accuse Christ. And this is prophesied for us in the book of Psalms. Psalm 35 verse 11 reads, False witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. 
Okay? They laid to my charge things that I knew not. And they came lying about me, says Jesus. I didn't even know what they're talking about. It's, I never did anything of the things they, they uh, said that I, that I had done. Hey, these were false accusers or false witnesses. And again, when Christ was, was arrested, he'd be brought forth to the chief priests, the scribes. And in, Psalm, sorry, in, in Matthew 26, verse 59, the Bible reads, Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. Okay, so, you know, the, these religious leaders tried to find people that would just falsely accuse Christ. And these false witnesses, you know, were, were prophesied in the book of uh, Psalms as well. All right, so after they tried to falsely accuse him, they couldn't find something to accuse him of. Ultimately, you know, he was, Jesus Christ was brought before Pilate and Pilate decided to crucify Christ. He even washes his hands and says, look, I'm innocent. He, he finds no fault in Christ. But he gives into the, the, the demand of the masses. He gives into the demand of the population. And if you can go to Psalm 22, please. Go to Psalm 22, verse 16. It speaks of the type of, of death, the type of torture that Christ would suffer. Okay? And if you ask somebody, you know, how, how, did, you know, how did Jesus Christ die? You know, nine out of ten people know. They'll say, well, he was crucified. You know, he was placed on that cross. And of course, this was spoken about in the book of Psalms. And re remember, in, in the time that these things were written in the book of Psalms, crucifixion wasn't even a, a, a method of death. It wasn't even a method of torture. Okay? But in Psalm 22, verse 16, the Bible reads, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. They pierced my hands and my feet. And of course, that piercing would be the nails that would go through the hands of Christ, the nails that would go through the feet of Christ, and he would be there nailed to that cross, the cross of Calvary. And in Luke 23, verse 33, it says, And when they came to the place, sorry, and when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. So they crucified Christ, okay? They pierced his hands. They pierced his feet, spoken of many centuries before in the book of Psalms. It's amazing. It's amazing these prophecies, how these prophecies came true in the life of Christ. I mean, we get a great appreciation for the word of God. Christ, of course, being the word of God manifest in the flesh. You know, and, um, you know, I, I, the reason I wanted to go through this in a, in a sermon or in a Bible study was just simply so we can appreciate the Bible, you know, appreciate the Psalms. You know, it, it's not just another book. You know, this book has been written by God himself, you know, a, a God that knows the future, a God that had the plan of redemption in place, knowing full well that his son will die by crucifixion and allowing King David to write about this in, in, in the book of Psalms. Look at, look at Psalm 22, same, same uh, Psalm, look at verse number 18. Psalm 22, verse 18. And they part my garments among them and cast lots up upon my vesture. I mean, just the, just the detail there, right? So when Christ would be on the cross, we know the story of what took place there and how his garments were divided by the soldiers. And I'll just read the story to you in Matthew 27, verse 35. It says, And they crucified him and parted his garments, cast in lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they did cast lots. And again, I've told him this before, how, how you know, clothing was expensive back in those days. You know, they, they didn't have all the machinery that we have in China. You know, you know, manufacturing clothing at a significantly cheap price. You know, clothing was expensive. And, and you know, good clothing today is expensive. And so instead of, you know, that clothing going to waste, the soldiers took it upon themselves. They decided, let's div divide it amongst ourselves. And the way they divided it was just by casting lots. 
you know, by rolling some dice, whatever, whatever way they cast lots back then. Even that level of detail is recorded for us in the book of Psalms. And also, I'll just read one more time. It said there, uh, cast in lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. And so all these Psalms that we have, you know, all the psalmists that wrote the Psalms, the Bible says these are prophets. You know, we think about how the Bible is divided, and I, I like how the Bible is divided. You know, we talk about the minor prophets, and we talk about the, the, the major prophets. But the book of Psalms was written by prophets as well. In fact, the entire Bible was written by prophets. You know, all Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, are written by people that prophesy the Word of God, that God moved with the Holy Ghost in them to write, to pen these words of God. And so, you know, don't disregard the book of Psalms. Understand it is written by prophets speaking very much so of Jesus Christ. And of course, once Christ's garments were, were divided, if you can go to Psalm 69. Psalm 69 and verse number 21. We know that Christ became thirsty and they didn't offer him water. The Bible says here in Psalm 69, verse 21, They gave me also gold for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Okay, and of course that took place on the cross. Christ was, was a thirst. And the Bible says in Matthew 27, verse 33, And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gold, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Okay, so even the very drink that Christ would drink on the cross is spoken about here in Psalms. If you go back to Psalm 22, go back to Psalm 22. And uh, so we have his type of death. We have what the soldiers are doing. We have even the kind of drink that would be offered unto Christ. But the Bible even records the words that Christ would speak while he was crucified on the cross. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art, why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Okay. So Christ spoke these heartbreaking words to his Father. And again, these are recorded for us in the New Testament once again in Matthew 27, verse 46, which reads, And about the ninth hour... Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, when Christ was on the cross, suffering his body, they had been offered that sacrifice unto us. He took on the sins of the world. He took on the pains, the griefs, the sorrows. He took it all, the infirmities upon his physical body. He became sin for us. And the Father could not look upon sin. You know, the Father cannot be, cannot fellowship with sin. And so, you know, the, the ultimate sacrifice of Christ was, was, was having the Father turn his face against him, was having God the Father reject Christ because he had become sin. You know, he had become that sacrifice unto us. You know, the suffering of Christ was, was great. And, uh, you know, Jesus Christ did not die from crucifixion. In fact, neither did the, the, the thief on the right and neither did the thief on the left. You know, they didn't die. From, normally people would die of crucifixion. But the issue here was that they were crucified just before Passover. And the Jews did not want these dead bodies. You know, it would defile their holiday, it would defile the Passover by having these dead human beings or, or these dying men, you know, to celebrate something that was supposed to be a holiday for them. And... Uh, you know, when, when Christ died, the Bible says he gave up the ghost. He made the decision that this is the point, you know, it is finished. He commended his spirit unto the Father and he decided to, to give up the ghost. And so Jesus Christ allowed himself to die, you know. And uh, in Psalm 34, if you go to Psalm 34, Psalm 34 and verse number 20, Psalm 34 verse 20, the Bible reads, He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. You see, when Christ was crucified, when he was beaten, when he was mocked, he, he never had a broken bone. 
Yes, his body was destroyed. It was whipped, his body bled, but his bones were not broken. Okay? And of course, when, when these three were on the cross, the, the Jews wanted these bodies taken down. He wanted, they wanted them to die quickly. And so we read in John 19, verse 31, John 19, verse 31, it says, The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might not, that, sorry, that they might be taken away. And so the Jews went to Pilate and say, look, can you break their legs? We don't want them hanging there during the Passover. Can you break them? And, and by breaking legs, then they can't lift themselves up to breathe, right? That, that would be the situation on the cross. They would have to, with their legs being, being, uh, being uh, nailed to the cross, they would use the strength of their legs to lift themselves up to take a breath, lift themselves up to take a breath. And by breaking their legs, they couldn't lift, they couldn't take a breath. And so they would die from suffocation. Okay, yes, they would have the pain of their broken legs, but then they couldn't lift themselves up to take a breath. They would die from a lack of oxygen. And then it says in verse number 32, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which were crucified with him. So they broke the legs of the one on the right, the one on the left, so they would die from lack of oxygen. But then in verse 33, it says, But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Okay? So they didn't break the legs of Christ because he was already dead. He, he already gave up the ghost. You know? He already commended his spirit to the Father. And so they didn't have to break his legs. I mean, it's, it's amazing that this detail is put in, in here for us in the Word of God. Now go to Psalm 16. Go to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. And of course, after Christ died, we celebrate the fact that he didn't stay dead. You know, we celebrate the fact that he was resurrected. And in Psalm 16, verse 10, the Bible reads, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And so we have two elements here uh, of Christ, his soul. And when it says thine holy one to see corruption, that's referring to the body of Christ. That's referring to the flesh of Christ. We know that because that speaks, that's what, it's, that's what it points to in the New Testament. But his soul would not be left in hell, so it would be delivered from hell, and his body would not remain in the grave. He would be resurrected, of course, on the third day. And, you know, this is repeated for us in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 30, which reads, Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him, and that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seen this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So you can see there, it says, neither his flesh did see corruption. And in Psalm 16.10, it said, neither thou would suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So the holy one refers to there, to the body, to the flesh of Christ, that would be resurrected from from the grave. So not only do we have the death of Christ prophesied in the book of Psalms, we have the resurrection of Christ being spoken about there in the book of Psalms. It's amazing. Amazing. Now please go to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2 verse 7. Psalm chapter 2 verse 7. And when Christ was resurrected from the dead, God the Father makes an announcement about his son. Okay? Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. Some people have misunderstood this passage and they think this is about his birth in Bethlehem's manger. But actually, this is about his resurrection. And I'll show that to you in a moment. Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, which says, I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Okay. Now, of course, when it comes to, to King David, you know, we speak about, you know, I, I suppose for, for any human being, the day where we're born is the day we're begotten, you know. But when it comes to Christ, yes, he was born in Bethlehem's manger, of course. But it's, it, this passage of the, being the begotten Son of God is actually a reference to his resurrection. How do we know that? We know that because of what the New Testament teaches. And I'll just read it to you in, in uh, Acts 13, verse 33. Acts 13, verse 33, speaking about the resurrection of Christ. I'll just show you that. It says, 
uh, God have fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he have raised up Jesus again. So when he was he raised up again? At you know, the resurrection, raised up. As it is also written in the second psalm. So we looked at Psalm 2, the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Okay? So what day was Christ begotten of the Father? The day that he was born in Bethlehem's manger? No, no. The day that he was resurrected from the dead. This is why the Bible refers to Christ as the first begotten from the dead. Okay? So the begotten Son of God refers to the fact that he would be resurrected from the dead. That he was resurrected on the day. That is the day that he was beca became the begotten Son of God. Okay? So... Now, of course, once he was resurrected, once this announcement of, of he being uh, the Son of God, then Christ also, at his resurrection, received uh, the, the, the position of the high priest. You know, not, not a priesthood after the priesthood of uh, the Levites, but the priesthood after Melchizedek. And if you can go to Psalm 110, Psalm 110, of course, Melchizedek was a priest that Abraham encountered in Psalm 110, verse number 4. The Bible says, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay? So Jesus Christ, when he takes on that priesthood, he would have that priesthood forever. God would not repent. God would not change his mind. Jesus Christ would be that high priest of Melchizedek forever okay you say well when did that happen well it happened at his resurrection okay and in hebrews 5 5 we read about this hebrews 5 5 it says so also christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest but he that said unto him thou art my son today have i begotten thee so again what is that re a reference of again the resurrection of Christ. As he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so we see on the day that Christ was resurrected from the dead, he took on that office. He took on the office of a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, So we don't need priests today. We don't need priests in the New Testament like priests were required in the Old Testament we have the high priest, which is Christ, and ourselves have been made kings and priests unto the Lord. Okay, so we have direct access to God. We don't need to go through a separate priesthood system. You know, we're priests and Christ is our high priest. Okay, so after Christ was resurrected from the dead, many witnesses saw him. He came proclaiming the Great Commission. We know that he was then ascended up into heaven, you know, in, in, that, in that cloud and wouldn't you know it, Psalms speaks about the ascension as well. So if you go to Psalm 110, Psalm 110, oh, we were there already, weren't we? Psalm 110, and look at verse number one. It says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Okay? Sit thou at my right hand until I make my, thine enemies thy footstool. So this would, of course, be Christ at a point where he would not be at the right hand of the Father. And then the Father says, well, come and sit at my right hand. Okay? Well, when did that take place? Well, we know in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 32. Acts, chapter 2, verse 32, the Bible reads, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he have shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he, himse but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. And I say, Okay, so David, King David, has not ascended into heaven. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, hold on, is, aren't all the saints in heaven? Yes, all the saints that have died are in heaven, but no one has ascended to heaven in their physical bodies because the resurrection has not taken place yet. The rapture has not yet taken place, but the one that did receive the resurrected body was Christ. 
and Christ would be ascended up into heaven. And of course, speaking of that is the fact that the father would say to the son, sit thou at my right hand. It wasn't about David. That was actually about Jesus Christ. Again, prophesied to us in the book of Psalms. Now, please go to Psalm 68. Psalm 68. And verse number 18. So when Christ ascended up to heaven, listen, he did not leave us powerless. In fact, he left us with great power. He left us with the comforter. He left us with the Holy Ghost. But as a believer, he also left us with spiritual gifts. And those spiritual gifts are given out by the Holy Spirit. Okay? He has given us spiritual gifts. Now look at Psalm 68, verse 18. It says, Thou hast ascended on high. That's speaking of Christ. He is ascension into heaven. Thou hast led captivity captive. Now, if you remember what that is, that's someone that's been taken captive and then, you know, the situation gets turned on its head and the captive becomes the one that takes, uh, the one that had captured them into captivity, okay? And of course, this speaks of us who have been taken in, uh, uh, you know, cap captive by the power of sin, the fact that we have that sinful nature, and then when Christ has come and we believe on him, he's given us that new man, he's given us power over sin, he's given us power to overcome sin, and then we've been able to overcome sin, we've been taken from a captive to a captor. Okay? And so this, of course, plays into the ascension of Christ there. But then it reads, Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Okay, so... This is speaking about the Lord dwelling among us. What's that about? Well, notice that it spoke about receiving gifts for men. Okay. Now, when you read that, that might sound like men are giving gifts to the Lord. But actually, when you read about it in the book of um, Ephesians, this gets repeated. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. And this is speaking about the local church, speaking about the New Testament church. It says, But unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. You see, <clears throat> salvation, grace, salvation by grace through faith is a gift of God. Okay? And here we see the measure of gift of Christ. Yes, salvation is a gift, but not just salvation. It keeps reading, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So he gave gifts unto men. That passage that we read about was actually Christ giving gifts to us. Verse number 9. Now that, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And of course, the body of Christ is your local New Testament church. The Bible says that Christ has given us gifts, gifts of ministry, gifts of preaching, you know, gifts of, of teaching. You know, the, the, the man that stands behind the pulpit and teaches and preaches, yes, myself as a pastor, but other people that do such things have been given a gift by God and again, what was the reference that we saw there in, in Psalm 68, verse 18? It says at the end of it, uh, that the Lord God might dwell among them. You see, when we, when we come into church, the Lord God dwells among us. He's here. His presence is in church when we gather together. And again, the sad thing, the sad reality that we can't gather right now in that sense. You know, gather in the body of Christ. You know, we can gather amongst other brethren, other believers, you know, friends, and we can praise God together, praise God for that. But when it comes to the local body, the body of Christ, you know, right now we're lacking that opportunity to express the gifts that Christ has given us, and He's given us these gifts so we can edify the body. Okay? And I can't wait once again for us to be gathered once again in church. Please go to Psalm chapter 2, Psalm chapter 2 and verse number 9. Psalm 2. Verse number 9. So we have Christ, he ascended up into heaven. And we know Christ is coming back. Okay? We know Christ is coming back. And how is he coming? Is he coming meek and mild? Is he coming as that lamb? 
No, he comes as a lion. He comes as one of great power, one of great authority. And in Psalm 2 verse 9, it says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. It says here, when Christ comes to rule, when he comes to take power from, from the Antichrist, from, from, from the kings of the earth, he comes as one coming in authority, comes as one with a rod of iron. So much so that the illustration given us here is taking a potter's vessel, you know, taking a piece of pottery and just smashing it, you know, just, just it falling apart. You know, Christ comes with great power, destroying the armies, destroying the kingdoms of the earth and bringing all the kings and kingdoms unto himself, ruling with that rod of iron. And the picture that we have in Revelation 19 verse 15, if you may recall, Revelation 19 is when Christ comes on the white horse. And it says in verse number 15, And out of his mouth go for sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Christ is coming to rule with a rod of iron. He comes, he destroys those armies with, with a sharp sword that proceeds out of his mouth, and he rules with a rod of iron. This was prophesied to us once again in Psalms. You know, Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is amazing because it spoke there of the resurrection of Christ, the fact that he would die, but it also speaks that he's going to rule with authority, with great power. And of course, this is speaking about the millennium kingdom. Now, please go to Psalm 22. We're going to end on this one, Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verse 27. The Bible reads, And all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. I shall read verse 28 as well. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. Wow. You know, to think about there's a coming a time. I mean, we can't say this already happened. There's never been a time when all the, all the people of the earth, all the kindreds of the nations will come and worship God. We've never seen that happen. You know, the, the most we've seen is, of course, the nation of Israel. You know, when they were right with God, they would worship God. We've seen that, but we've never seen all the nations worship God. And when Christ comes to rule in his kingdom, you know, every people, all nations, all kindreds of all the world will come and worship Christ because he's going to be the governor. He's going to be the one ruling from Jerusalem. And, you know, it, it says in Revelation 11, verse 15, remember it said in Psalm 22, verse 28, for the kingdom is the Lord's. Well, in Revelation 11, verse 15, it says it like this, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. And so we see, you know, the book of Psalms speaks so much of Christ. Again, the title for the sermon tonight was Jesus in the Psalms. And I hope, you know, I've been able to open up your understanding. I hope I've been able to help you understand the scriptures a little bit more as you read through the Psalms, or at least appreciate the Psalms a lot more. It's not just the Psalms. I mean, Jesus Christ is found throughout all the... You know, every book of the Bible speaks of Christ in, in some, compa some capacity. What did Jesus Christ say once again? He says, uh, All things must be fulfilled, that uh, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Christ says the entire Old Testament was pointing to Christ. You know, it blows my mind when I hear preachers saying that the Old Testament saints knew nothing of Christ's death knew nothing about the, you know, that he would uh, bring about the church age, you know, they, they, how they use that term. We saw that Christ came delivering gifts, spiritual gifts for the local church, okay? So these are, these are things that were taught and, and, and uh, written about in the Psalms. Don't forget that in the Old Testament days, you know, in the, in the, so let's say the New Testament, we have preachers, we have pastors, we have teachers in the body of Christ. Well, in the Old Testament days, they had prophets, you know, they had the scriptures. People would read the scriptures and they had prophets teaching people the word of God. Hey, even the priests, 
You know, even the Levitical priests were commanded to teach people what was holy and unholy, to teach people about the Bible, to teach people the scriptures. And when the priests did not teach, when the prophets did not teach, there was a famine for the word of God, you know. And I, and I hope, once again, brethren, you know, I hope that Bible study was beneficial to you. And, you know, really appreciate the Psalms. It's, it's such an amazing book. You know, it serves many purposes. It serves the purpose of study. It serves for the purpose of singing songs. It just serves the, for the purpose of, of being close to the Lord, for having your heart set right, you know, to desire to fellowship with God. All right. God bless.